I assume there's some sort of view, like really pretty view, but I can't look because I feel like I'll fall to my death. If you go a little bit that way or a little bit that way, big consequences. I want to see if I can stand up on this. Okay. I don't like this feeling. I thought I might like it, but I don't. Maybe this, this is better. Oh, God. Where I'm standing right now is basically a farmer's junkyard, but below my feet under the ground is a military junkyard. It's a Titan I nuclear missile silo. Literally right under our feet, there were nuclear bombs. There were three nuclear bombs right here. I can understand why so many people were so paranoid during the Cold War, because not only were they afraid of nuclear bombs coming from Russia, but they were living on top of nuclear bombs. It's a scary, scary thought. A scientific thunderbolt gives a preview of its destructive force. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially where you're not covered. If you had some plutonium inside you, you wouldn't make any plans to celebrate the event. Plutonium's half-life is 24,000 years. After World War II, people lost their minds with nuclear hysteria. With warning and without any warning. The insane power of the atom bomb had been unleashed on Japan, and the US wasted no time jumping into an all-out arms race with the Soviet Union. Requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. A traditional show of power by the Russians. But no one pulled the trigger, because they knew the other side would destroy them too. It was known as MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. When the Soviet Union fell in 91, the Cold War was officially a four decades long bluff. Probably the most expensive bluff in human history. The US spent trillions stockpiling their arsenal, but they're in no hurry to clean up the mess. That's why places like the Titan I nuclear missile silo have been left abandoned in remote places all over America. I invited Kristen Allen to join me. He's a Cold War buff who grew up in a proud military family. It's crazy, like a scene from a zombie movie. For him, visiting an abandoned missile silo is high on his bucket list. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, southern Alaska, just outside of Elmendorf Air Force Base. You're like right next door to uh, Yeah, Russia. I can see Russia from my house. Yeah, <laughs> that's a famous um, quote. Growing up in the 80s, you know, it wasn't really a case of if nuclear war was gonna happen, it was like kind of when nuclear war was gonna happen. That was the sentiment, like people felt that way? It was a thing that you prepared for, just like you prepared for earthquakes, you know, you knew where the fallout shelters were, you know, where to go in the school, you know, how to sit, how to cover your head. Do you think there's a general paranoia in America that nuclear war will happen? Uh, I don't think so much anymore. I think we've replaced uh, nuclear war with, with other boogeymen. Right. I don't think it's as heightened as, as it was. Um, and maybe that's even a bad thing because, you know, it, there are still tons of nuclear weapons out there. Right, yeah. <laughs> Tours of old nuclear facilities are hard to come by. But the caretaker of this right. site yeah. 
David Byrne, has made a business out of it. Well, today we're gonna go down inside the Titan One missile complex. Okay. Show you guys some of the stuff most people don't ever get to see. David said the complex took over three years to build in the late 50s, but it was shut down almost immediately. And why'd they shut it down? Because it was actually obsolete when they were finishing construction. They were developing other technologies so quickly that it was pointless to keep this one around. This missile silo is one of hundreds across the U.S. that were already out of date by the time they were ready for action. Well, this is the personnel entrance to the launcher. This thing's not gonna fall on her head, is it? Oh, you wouldn't know it if it did. <laughs> so this was the freight elevator to bring everything into the silo? Yep. Whoa. This stairwell doesn't feel very solid. So this room is a powerhouse. It's big. This is a big room. <laughs> Feels like a movie theater. People used to live here? Yes, so this complex had 12 people assigned here, two officers and 10 enlisted men, and they lived and ate and did everything. And they just this, stayed in here? They stayed in here, yep. So we're in the tunnels that connect everything? Right in the main hub. I think I've had a nightmare about this tunnel at some point. <laughs> Would it have looked pretty much just like this when it was operational? Maybe a little nicer um, paint job or something? Most of this would be full of wires. Would these rockets that were here, would they be meant for stopping rockets from coming here or just shooting off in, into land? These were purely offensive, so they were just designed to uh, shoot a really big warhead over into the Soviet Union somewhere. I believe these warheads were like 3.75 megatons, which is about 250 times the Hiroshima bomb. Really? Yeah. And they were sitting here? And there was three of them sitting here, yeah. This is where the radar antennas would come down. You can see the, the tracks, there's three tracks on the side. So people who live near these silos probably don't feel the safest. I was talking to an old gentleman at the restaurant in town, and he said growing up, he would be out playing in the yard, and he'd all of a sudden see a 90-foot missile coming up, and they never knew if it was a test or if it was a real thing, and so they would just keep their eye on them. And if these missiles ever left, that meant World War III was happening right then. That's spooky. It's pretty interesting to see how much work went into these places. It's kind of crazy that it was only used for about two years. And even then, it wasn't really being used. It's like a huge waste of resources and money and energy. Right up here, we're going to a spot where all the floor is on the suspension. So it's not actually touching underneath. It's just hanging from the ceiling. Oh. So that this, this part of the complex could take a shock, and this would just ride it out. And we can make it rock? You can make it rock if you're Good at teamwork. Right, left. Oh, wow. <laughs> this room is rocking. Well, this is classic military. You notice what these two are, right? You're sitting there, and I'm sitting here. Yeah. This is how the military works? <laughs> hey, brother. Hey, how's it going? The complex seemed endless, but we'd only seen half of it. To see the rest, we had to climb all the way back to the surface. That's when David suggested a wardrobe change. We're getting changed into wetsuits because there's chest high water in there apparently and it's really cold. How's the view? I'm ready to enter the missile silo. Oh, yeah. I feel like I'm in the coolest sci-fi movie. Oddly beautiful. Like, I didn't expect it to be, like, pretty. Oh, the armpits don't like the cold. 
How many stories is that? It's about 11 stories straight down. I'm feeling like a fear of heights right now, even though I'm in the water. Yeah, it's like your rational brain says, if you fall, you can just swim, but... Your eyeball says it's a long ways down. This shaft once held a 100-foot-long, 110-ton intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, it's a giant underwater playground for scuba divers. I have a sinking feeling that I'm gonna have to jump into this water from the top just because it's a nuclear missile silo and when you're in a nuclear missile silo that's full of water, you gotta dive in. Okay, I'm gonna jump off of this thing. You're high. Yeah, it's pretty high. I can't see the water with the legs on it. All right, I'm gonna go. I couldn't see the water. <laughs> My eyes were open when I hit the water. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Dude, I didn't think this was gonna be so fun. <laughs> I'm going to Satsop Nuclear Power Plant. Well, it was supposed to be a nuclear power plant, but they pulled the plug on the project just before they finished it. And I see it now. Whoa, there's two big towers. Ground broke on Satsop in 1977. But thanks to a massive budget up and a growing anti-nuke movement, the project was abandoned before a watt of power was ever produced. Today, Satsop stands as a gigantic $2 billion tombstone for the utopian nuclear power movement of the 70s. Yikes. Looking at these places, it sort of feels like there's this ominous thing about to happen. Like if this was full of corn or something, I'd be like, oh, it's just a silo, it's just a tube. But because this is meant to be a nuclear power facility, it sort of has like a stigma. Like, that's the end of the world. Even though there's never been radioactive material here, just looking at the structure gives me bad vibes. But I met up with someone who's actually really stoked about nuclear energy. Jessica Lovering is the director of energy for the Breakthrough Institute, an environmental think tank focused on clean energy this is the kind of place you like to hang out normally? <laughs> Not normally, but I'm, it's very cool to come here and see these. So what is the structure we're looking at? This is the reactor containment building. It's just a big shell now. Wow. I grew up in the 80s in the era of being told that nuclear is bad and scary. Mm -hmm. When I see them, I think, you know, meltdowns. I think nuclear bombs. I think three-eyed fish. <laughs> I don't think it was intentional or, you know, someone misrepresented nuclear. I think it's fair that a lot of people have those associations, especially yeah. from, uh, you know, our history with nuclear weapons. But I think it, it is unfair for nuclear power to get lumped together with all things military and Cold War. It's really a very separate technology. It's actually kind of sad thinking about what could have been. It could have produced a huge amount of clean energy. That's really what we abandoned, was that promise and vision of a clean right. energy system. Would Satsop have produced clean energy for generations to come? Or would it have poisoned this beautiful landscape? It's impossible to know. But to Jessica, Satsop was a huge missed opportunity. Why nuclear? Why, why are you interested in, in that option? I was really motivated by climate change and finding solutions to climate change. I started out looking at all sorts of energy. To me, if you need a large amount of clean energy, nuclear is the best option. Right. 30 years ago, you know, or 40 years ago in the 70s, 
we were on this path towards a really bright future of lots of abundant clean energy and things went wrong and we changed our minds and we kind of took a different path. Did we make the right choice? I, I would say no, but right. um, sort of thinking about how can we make sure we're making the right choice going forward. Although the big nuclear projects seem really scary and big, it's actually, to me, they're sort of inspiring, getting you know thousands of people to work on this project and build these huge structures that are gonna provide electricity for 60 or 80 years. Like right. That scale and that audacity aren't frightening to me. They're very um, optimistic and filling me with hope. Satsop never produced any electricity, but the space hasn't totally gone to waste. This enormous tower has found itself producing a whole different type of energy. Apparently these things are giant amplifiers. So I'm gonna meet up with a local percussionist named Paul Kikuchi has been making recordings in them. You need help hauling some uh, uh, gongs? Yeah, indeed. Ooh. So here's one of the large tams we'll be bringing up. OK. Um, so this is one you could grab if you yep. uh, and I'll grab the large wind gong. We can start there. We're about to enter cooling tower. WNP3, as they call it. What? It's the feeling of almost like entering a cathedral. But it's better. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, unbelievable. That's crazy. And it amplifies it. So it's really easy to get a lot of people clapping for you when you perform here. Exactly. You just get like, yeah. Yeah, huge audience. <laughs> <laughs> How did you uh, hear about this place? It's kind of iconic in the sound artist, musician, experimental musician world. It's become a destination, really, for people yeah. all, over, all over the world, yeah. In a way, the first time I recorded here was more just out of sheer interest in this yeah. sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But since then, it's taken on new meaning, you know? Right. Since Paul recorded here in 2011, the Fukushima disaster happened, an event that struck close to home. My relatives were from one of the hardest hit areas of the tsunami. Luckily, they survived it. So what are your feelings on nuclear power? It's, it's hard to say that nuclear is a great evil and that we have great alternatives, but it shines a light on that inclination humans have to design things and not really think about what could happen. Right. You know, it's like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. It's like. Yeah oh, there's a bunch of oil leaking from the bottom of the ocean, and we don't, we're not quite sure how to stop this. We're standing in a nuclear cooling tower about to bang some gongs, which is, uh, I think, a really cool repurposement of this place. I agree. Yeah. I have an idea for a piece I want to try with you, thinking of the, that 100-foot tsunami wave or whatever, just that raging wall of water, where we basically just start really quiet and build up just to a, a raging crescendo. I'm malleted. I'm also malleted. Longing. The abandoned Titan I missile silo, 
and the Satsot power plant are nuclear relics that were never put into action. But paranoia from that era still hangs in the air, especially on the West Coast, where the fear of radiation was reawakened after the Fukushima disaster. Right now I'm on the Washington coast. Right behind me is the Pacific Ocean. And out that way is Japan. I think at the time of the Japanese tsunami and the Fukushima disaster, that there were a lot of people on the west coast here that were really afraid of radioactive material coming over here. I think that fear has died down a lot. It's been five years. But there still are some people that are, are concerned about it. One of those people is Cameron McCurdy. He basically abandoned society and moved into his van, which is decked out for survival. Let me show you my kit that I got. OK. There's a couple different systems. It's all about redundancy. Right. So like I have a day pack, and yep. then I have my bug out bag. And so they're going to have some of the same items, but they're all different kits. Okay. So I got uh, superfoods. There's some goji berries on top. This is like full of meats and different uh, protein powders. Oh, so okay. there's some salmon and spam that'll last a few years. Yeah, you got, got your wet wipes. Mitt. Yeah, you got to have butt wipes in the wilderness, man. That's like the number one thing, man. So your hygiene <laughs> will go downhill real fast in two, three days. So nice. you got to keep it clean. You're in the van now, but have you spent a lot of time outdoors? Yeah, I do love tenting and and hiking, the less shelter, the better. I like sleeping just on the ground or in a bivy bag, a biovac sack. It's pretty fascinating to see what you can get away with not having. Right. So ideally, I, I want to be good enough at survival where I can just walk around with the fanny pack and have enough to survive. So you think someone might have been sleeping here? Yeah, it looks like there's a little dugout area, and it's got a windbreak, and they've done a pretty good job of building it up with the, the logs. So I think that would shelter us at least from the wind. But um, I would have thought it was just like some kid building a playhouse. Yeah, I don't know. This is pretty cool. But let's see if I can feel the wind in here. That would work. Yeah, to keep warm, though, at night, it's a good idea to do like just air squats, you know? So just like you just keep your core temperature up just doing like that. So you can stay active or you can get um, protected from the elements in something like this. Wow. Yes. I like the beach vibe. Yeah, you should definitely move out here. Just driving out here is cool. Do you remember where you were when Fukushima happened? Yeah, I was in Seaside, and I had my everyday carry backpack ready to go, and extra water, and a growler, and a glass container, and a lantern. So I was ready. The whole town was evacuated, really? so I was checking that out. Do you think there's a lot of people here that just are oblivious to that um, possibility of a tsunami? No, I think everybody that lives here is concerned about it, really. And we do have weekly tsunami tests in the area, so they. They test the sirens, and, right. and we hear those all the time. Oh, okay. But we don't know how far offshore the earthquake is going to be. So it could be just right offshore, and we might only have a few minutes to get to higher ground. Tell you what, though, it definitely helps me sleep at night knowing that I have the bags ready to go yeah. and survival caches yeah. in the ground. Cam doesn't just have his van primed for disaster. He has bug out kits buried on escape routes all over the coast so he can bolt whenever the shit hits the fan. What threats do you believe exist right now that, that you might have to face? Right now, I'm concerned about tsunamis and earthquakes and civil unrest. I'm also concerned about being homeless because I live a pretty crazy lifestyle. So that's why I'm building these caches and getting the gear that I need just in case something like that does happen. Right, in case you can't like make enough funds to Mm -hmm, survive mm -hmm. Yeah, at least I have the basics, you know? Right. I have shelter and water, so yeah. got everything I need. I don't even know what day of the week it is right now. <laughs> I don't even like looking at calendars or a watch, so yeah. um, I'm a pretty free spirit right now. Was there an event that happened with you in working or something that made you just over it? 
I'd have to say it was just going through a divorce, honestly. So that kind of freed me up. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to do what I want from here on out. And that's when I kind of blossomed. So right. when I stopped making all these compromises and stopped settling, that's when I became the person I was supposed to be. Just doing my own thing and then cuddling on the side what as do you a mean? professional. I'm a professional cuddler, so I give hugs for a living. Really? Yeah, yeah. Dollar a minute. Would you like one? Sure. You a hugger? Give me one. Hug. Bring it in. Bring it in, man. Wow, you're good at it. Yeah. Awesome. You're pretty comfortable. <laughs> Bring it in, man. You're a great hugger. <laughs> How did you get into cuddling for a living? Well, it actually started because of the van dwelling thing. So I was living out in the woods and running the hot springs, and I realized that I need more touch. So then I sought it out, and I started cuddling my friends and some family members. And then I'm like, hey, I can do this professionally. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give you a hug anytime. All right. Maybe later. I'm still feeling the one we just had. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cam, for me, is hard to gauge. He's really unique. <laughs> I would say that Cam has abandoned society in a lot of ways. I actually think he really enjoys this lifestyle. Like, it's a challenge and it's fun. He just probably doesn't want to live a normal nine to five lifestyle. I think he has a lot of worries about society in general. He's doing donuts right now. He's gonna flip that thing. If you're in a tsunami evacuation zone, the ocean is a disaster waiting to happen. Walking along a beach that will sooner or later be pummeled by a massive seismic wave, I was inspired to build my own survival kit. And I didn't want to do it alone. This is John Rattray, former skateboard teammate. What's up? Current friend. Is it weird we're both wearing black hoodies? Uh, nope. Do you have a plan for the day? Uh, we're gonna go and do some tsunami survival preparation. Okay. But first we skate. Just for general exercise? Enjoyment, exercise, entertainment. Okay. What's the trick that's associated with the end of the world? Is there a radioactive? Is there a bomb? Bomb drop. Bomb drop. We have any other kind of Armageddon themed maneuvers? Probably just a front side Ollie disaster. Okay. Hurricane. I think we've done all the disaster-related themed tricks. Is there a trick called a tsunami? Not that I know. We could just do anything and call it a tsunami. Oh, well, then a cab pivot. Yeah. That... I mean, cab pivot's a boring name for it anyway. Yeah. Now it's the tsunami. Yeah. Your turn. You got this, Rick. Come on. That was good. You got this, Rick. Come on. I'm going to post that one. Even though me and John have been friends for years, we've never really taken the time to discuss the end of the world. Was it something he even thought about? Was he prepared? Do you think there would be some sort of end days or disaster that's going to happen? I'm open to it. Earthquake, volcano, uh, Trump. Have you done any kind of prepping for anything? No. No, I just, recently I feel like I haven't had time. It's one of those things that it's easy to procrastinate on. Right. The, the whole prepping for a disaster that may or may not happen when there's like daily life to deal with. Right. I think a lot of people come at this topic with fear. Yeah, and that would be the, I need firearms, I need ammunition, I need to defend my home from the cannibals that are gonna try and eat my face. Right. 
I met this guy named Cam, who's a prepper. Okay. So today I want to bring you to meet Cam, and he's going to teach us how to prep. That's good. Yeah. We're going to be developing some skills at least. Yeah. All right. Let's talk to him. He's a nice guy. What's up, Cam? Hey, put her there, man. Good cool. Yeah. This is John. Hey, John. How's it going? Here. Cam Cuddles. Great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So the plan today is to build a cache. Find some supplies, put them in some sort of container, and then bury it somewhere for another day. Yeah, exactly. I want you to be prepared for a tsunami. If you're out here, you'll have the gear. Right. When building a survival kit, you'd probably think food and water would be number one on the list. But you'd be wrong. What do you think? Knife knife or like a tool? A multi-tool, multi right? Tool. Are we just making one cache? No, we're going to make one each, so you might need another. Well, then in that case, when the smoke settles, the lines become clear between what is good and what is not. Guard the good. See their marketing? Yeah. Sold it to me. Knives, check. Headlamp, check. Gloves, first aid kit. Glow stick, check, check, check. Check out these cash containers, potentially. I feel like that's a good size. Is this too big now? Honestly, I feel like this will do. I guess what we're doing is we're creating some sort of a semblance of an insurance policy. May or may not pay off, but you're at least some way prepared for dealing with what could be a pretty crazy situation. I feel like my cash is going to be better than John's, because I feel like my box is the perfect size and his is too big. It's funny, I went a little bigger in my container. I want to have like decent amount of food in there. It's kind of a bummer to be hungry. So we'll see how we go. Rick has a smaller container. I mean, I want to share with Rick the food, obviously. But I hope it wouldn't end in violence. I really yeah, do. He's got That's pretty solid. Violence isn't the only danger you need to guard against. Cam insisted on ponchos for the rain and cord, because you just never know when you'll need cord. This is parachute cord. It has inner strands, and we can unweave it all. So it's really easy to take apart. Right. There's only one. Yeah. You're coming up on all the good stuff. Oh, we're going to share it. OK. I doubt we're going to share it. I mean, I will have more food than you. So I'd bear that in mind. This is like a board game. Yeah, it certainly is. And just remember, I'll have more food than you. So that's 20 we'll share it. I know. I, I trust you. Okay. I'll let him use the little one. So we got all this for 30 bucks. 30 bucks. This is the string I'll share with you. Nice guy. Hmm. OK. After a long day of survival shopping, Cam took John and I to his hometown beach to prepare for the worst case scenario. All right, let's uh, divvy this up and get it packed into our boxes. You should be putting the stuff that you want first on the top. OK. I might should have got the bigger one. Well, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Do you eat meat? Yeah. Here's some meat, man. Wow. I think that's good for like 25 years or something crazy. And I'll give you this uh, superfood. This is some more green powder, so wheatgrass powder. Stimulant for your mind. You need some mind stimulant. Dude, I had two of those before we rolled out here. Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. I'm on another level. You'll go up and check on these and maybe just... Yeah, I'll rotate caches like these every couple years, make sure water didn't get in them. Yeah. But um, no, I'm really hoping for the best. I'm hoping my town doesn't get annihilated by a tsunami wave. Yeah, dude. But um, I got to be realistic. Do you feel like you're living kind of outside of regular society at the moment? Yeah, I'm trying not to pay attention to what's going on in the news and just following my passions. So the broader world out there, the news, does it get you down? Yeah, I think that's what it's designed to do, is depress you or distract you. So I'm not going to distract myself with any nonsense right now. I'm pretty focused on getting prepared and the whole cuddling game. So you think there's a design to it? I think there is. Yeah. I think there's some architects. At the Department of Defense is really in control of the media. But that'll right. probably get me killed for saying that. Well, we're <laughs> the media, and I don't think anybody's controlling us. <laughs> now that we know of. Not that I know of. 
maybe I've been a little paranoid, but um, I'm free now, and that's right. all that matters. Hanging out with Cam's been interesting. I think he has some really underlying uh, fears and paranoias that he kind of touched on a bit with like anti-government sentiment and you know talking about how uh, he doesn't trust a lot of things. But he's also a very caring person too. I haven't given you a hug yet. Can I give you one? For sure. Yeah. Bring it in. <laughs> You're a great hugger. Yeah, I like a hug. Yeah. How is it? It's nice. You want a hug? Yeah. Going around these days. That's good. The next step was to bury our survival kits. And I knew just the right place to do it. So John, this is a nuclear cooling tower. Oh, that's a big hole in the sky. The thing about burying the cache here is this looks like tough ground to dig in. Yeah. And somebody that watches this might know where it is and they'll just come steal it. Uh, yeah, it's sort of a landmark. That's awesome. John! John, 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 John. Do you know that there are skatable full pipes here? I've heard that, yeah. Would you like to skate them? All right. It's a good size full pipe. Yeah. I'm gonna sweep some dirt up into some piles. What sort of dust is that? I hope it's not radiation dust. No, it's probably just asbestos. Damn, should we be wearing breathing equipment? I'm trying not to kick up too much dirt. Yeah, well, you're doing a bad job of not kicking up dirt. Too much. Shit. I'm gonna get some fresh air. I feel like we should have some breathing apparatus for hitting up that tunnel. I don't trust the dust, and I uh, really want to maintain some healthy pulmonaries. The dust was a major bummer. Wow, that's some dust. But then we realized we were actually ready for anything. OK, <clears throat> let's see. We have to tap into our emergency stash for this situation. I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm gonna save the ginseng extract. But yeah, that's, this is probably a good call. Cam would be proud of us. At the first sign of trouble, we were prepared. Oh, wait. I think I'm gonna take this before we skate. Okay, you take that. I'll not take one, and then we can compare and contrast results. Okay. Power of three. It brings the, gas to, <laughs> the gastrointestinal tract back into balance. I'm gonna wait on that, and I'm gonna take it once I'm near a bathroom. Are you gonna use that to weatherproof any of your radio equipment? <laughs> I'm just serious. That's what you use it for if you're not going to use it for your knob. It's oily. You know, this might diffuse the light a bit. John and I are gonna to climb to the top of the cooling tower. 749 stairs all the way. Not that nervous right now. We'll wait for the nerves to kick in when we're about a third of the way up. You see how it arcs out like that? Yeah, that's... That's psycho. <sighs> this view right here is crazy. Look. Oh, I feel like I'm, I'm gonna just have to trust these stairs. <laughs> it doesn't seem like there's much holding it onto the side though. Oh, wow. This is weird. Now, this is very weird. <laughs> this is no less scary. 
I feel better standing on this solid piece of cement right now. And I almost feel like I'm on top of like a giant diving board, you know, your way to go in. <laughs> Do that and I'll go under you, though. Are right, you ready? Just put your feet on there, don't, don't do the thing. Jesus Christ. You can go that way. Why did we come up here? <laughs> I don't like looking down that. You know what keeps happening to me is my testicles keep getting a, a pain in them. What? With fear. You get like a feeling in your tummy with it fear. It goes all the way into your balls. Yeah. Hmm. It is interesting to think that when nuclear power was first being developed after, I guess, after World War II, the general perception of it was as something that's bright and utopian and futuristic and clean. I guess it took Chernobyl and Fukushima and a few other things to completely reverse public perception. And I wonder if in the face of like climate change based on carbon emissions from coal-fired plants, we're gonna have to, as a species, really ramp up on developing nuclear as an energy solution again. I can't say that nuclear is a clean energy because it's not. It just doesn't have the carbon emissions that the other ones have right now. It's a tough call. It's the lesser of many evils. People need a lot of power and they're not going to give it up. It sounds easy enough to say, you know, just use less power, or, like go off the grid more, but no one really wants to do that when you were talking seven billion people. Do you like the concept of the end of the world? No, don't like it. I like the world. I mean, there's some dumb shit in it, but for the most part, it's pretty fun. I mean, even abandoned nuclear reactor cooling towers are pretty cool. See, I don't want the world to end. And I don't either. It's weird how fear does that to you. Whether it's a fear of heights, fear of a tsunami, or a nuclear apocalypse, nothing makes you appreciate existence more than the fear of oblivion. So if you find yourself in despair about the end of the world, or anything at all, my advice is throw your arms around an old friend, or even someone you just met, and just squeeze. Listen to